Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Isa. Very nice to see you again. Uh, these conferences are an excellent opportunity to learn, but also to meet old friends and make new ones. Now, welcome to our conference, Boosting Youth Employment in Africa. Now, I don't think that title should trick you into thinking that we do not have any problems or issues with youth employment in this part of the world. Uh, so um, it is about Africa, uh, but I would encourage everyone to also use what you learn and what you hear uh, to counter the issue of youth unemployment in this part of the world. The Netherlands is doing relatively well um, but other parts of the EU are still in a lot of trouble. And we've seen in the past crisis that young people were the first ones uh, to suffer from employment issues. I myself studied in uh, the 80s, and uh, that was a very, uh, very dark time. A lot of economic crisis, and only uh, one in three of my uh, fellow students uh, found a job. Uh, in the first two, three, four years after we graduated. So youth unemployment is not something that is typical for Africa or Asia or Latin America or the EU or the United States. All of us need to make sure that young people are able to fulfill their dreams and the best way to do that is to find a job and to be able to earn your own living. So having said that, um, let us focus on Africa, because that's why you are all here and why you've invited me to speak. Um, looking at sub-Saharan Africa, um, it needs to create 18 million jobs every year up to 2035 in order to absorb uh, the new entrance into the labor market. Now, this is partly worrying news. How? on earth are we going to find so many jobs? But it's also good news because it means that so many young people um, graduated from whatever level of schooling they had, which I think is very different from many years ago where many young people were not able to uh, go to school at all. Um, and it's also an opportunity to use their energy and their capacities to help shape and build an Africa uh, that knows inclusive growth and not only growth that will benefit uh, the elites. Now, uh, if you look at the 35 million per year and you look at what, uh, how many jobs are created today, there is a bit of a gap, one has to acknowledge. Uh, at present, um, only 3 million formal jobs uh, are created annually. So we need you coming from the different perspectives, academics, uh, practice-based settings to answer uh, the pertinent questions about what works in creating jobs and what doesn't and why and how can we use those lessons to come to, I think Isa already mentioned it, to scalable uh, opportunities uh, for jobs. Now the EU Africa Summit in uh, November in Cote d'Ivoire is an excellent opportunity to talk about this. And I think the African Union was the first to put the issue uh, on the table for that summit. Um, there needs to be a substantial, effective, efficient, uh, ambitious plan for youth uh, employ for creating youth employment in Africa. Now, looking at uh, the issue, I think it's very important to kind of focus on um, where where are the issues? Um, and um, if you look at the facts, they're quite sobering. Six out of 10 uh, people in Africa are under 25. Uh, six out of 10 people in Africa live in rural areas. And it's in the rural areas where poverty is often at its worst, causing people to leave the rural area uh, for uh, city life. Um, at the same uh, time, most projections predict that um, the, in the rural areas, most jobs, uh, where most uh, young people will find employment, uh, be it uh, mostly in the informal sector, be it in small-scale farming and in small-scale uh, small, uh, farming-related business. Um, 
there's two issues with that. One is it's good news because if we look at um, uh, issues around food security, it's really good that people start to invest and continue to work in agriculture. There's also a downside, and that is for most young people, um, uh, farming is not something that they really aspire to. Uh, I come from a farmer's family myself, and uh, my parents, uh, my grandparents, their ambitions was not for us to go into farming, actually. It was to end up as a minister, uh, or at least, you know, behind the desk and not working the land. Um, and of course, on an individual level, I can fully understand that, and all of you can probably fully understand that, because many of us come from that background. Uh, but we need more young people in agriculture, but we need agriculture also to be attractive to young people. So we need to be able to use all the new technology that is available. We need to make sure that you can actually earn a living not only a subsist, at a subsistence level, but really earn a living uh, in agriculture to be, make it more attractive. So there is a lot of um, opportunities in agriculture, but also a lot of challenges. Now, um, I, I would suggest that uh, the group that has gathered here today is an excellent group to discuss those opportunities and challenges and come up with solutions. Um, we've been investing more and more in public-private partnerships, uh, not only on giving boys and girls education, but also how to tailor that education to market demands and to make sure that the market demands more sophisticated um, opportunities in, uh, in agriculture, for example. Um, there's a lot of untapped potential still looking at uh, the internet. Sub-Saharan Africa already has one of the highest levels of mobile phone penetration in the world. Um, and this has opened doors to amazing developments in the area of fintech. Technical solutions for improving access to financial services, for example. Innovations like the e-wallet have in, uh, in, uh, produced incredible results and are part of this, let me say, package to make uh, agriculture and rural areas more attractive to young people. We've also seen access to fertilizers and seeds increasing, um, and that is a kind of innovation that can really change the lives of millions of people, providing that each and every village in Africa uh, has an internet connection, an IT engineer, preferably a girl, and a workspace that keeps that momentum going. Um, so these are the opportunities. Now, looking at myself, coming from uh, the government side, what is it that governments can do? Basically, uh, we have two roles. Making sure that we remove obstacles that we have created sometimes ourselves, one has to be fair here, uh, and facilitate change. Now, removing obstacles um, it is true that countries are falling short. All too often, rules, regulations, bureaucracies, red tape, corruption, impedes change. Authorities act in unpredictable ways, sometimes arbitrary. Um, they're not, um, um, and, and that is not very conducive for investments by uh, the private sector. Um, but it's also sometimes very practical. In many countries, young people are still uh, not able to own land or to have bank accounts. Now, those obstacles really need to be, they really need to be removed. In terms of facilitating change, um, there is a lot of improvement to be made in terms of creating an enabling environment for young people to enter the labor force. Um, an enabling environment in terms of basic government services, infrastructure, electricity, energy, water. Um, and I think this is one of the areas where um, on an international level uh, there's a lot of opportunities to invest jointly and to work together, be it bilaterally or be it through institutions 
like the World Bank and others. Now, let me zoom in for a second uh, on uh, the private sector. What is it that they can do? Um, they can um, invest uh, in making uh, small-scale farmers a, a, a part and parcel of uh, supply chains. Um, and in that way, improving their productivity, improving their potential to create jobs. So basically helping those small-scale farmers to move from a subsistence informal way of working into a living wage, a more sophisticated uh, way of working and by doing so creating jobs. The private sector also needs to invest more in um, opportunities for education. They know what the market wants, but they need to work together more strongly with educational institutions to come up with curricula and training programs that are geared towards market demands. On the job learning programs, I mean, all these um, relatively practical uh, input needs to be provided by the private sector with an eye to creating jobs for young people. Um, now, um, let me end by um, mentioning uh, two um, concerns, but also opportunities. One concern is obviously that if we don't create jobs for young people, um, they will be, there will be an, um, a growing disparity, if you wish, between um, the educational uh, level of young people and job opportunities. So you go to school, but afterwards there's no job for you. Um, and so the gap between hope and reality will widen. And this is not something that we want for our own children, so why would we not make sure that we prevent it for other people's children? So um, making sure that young people can live up to their dreams is good for them, it's good for society, it's good for stability, um, but it's also a moral obligation, I would suggest. My last point is about how does this all relate to human rights and to women's rights? Um, McKinsey has come up with a study a few years ago that if women would be able to live up to their fullest potential, so if they could go to school, have access to means of production, including land, then the world economy uh, in the end would benefit by uh, enlarging itself with the size of the uh, combined economies of the United States and China. So, I mean, if we would be able to do that, that would uh, end hunger and it would provide opportunities for everyone. So investing in women's and girls' rights is, of course, a moral imperative. But if you don't, if that's not your, you know, the thing that takes you, you could, but it's a human right, that's universal, but if it doesn't take you, then focus on the economic opportunities uh, that uh, women and girls, uh, giving women and girls, making sure that they can access their rights, um, focus on those opportunities because it will benefit all of us. Now, if you're 18 and you already have three children and you had to drop out of school as a girl, uh, all this talk doesn't benefit you a lot. Uh, because you're in trouble, your family is in trouble, your community is in trouble. On the other hand, if we manage to make sure that that girl can say no if she wants to say no and can say yes if she wants to say yes and if she can protect herself uh, by um, making sure that she has access to family planning services, uh, if we are able to do that, uh, then all of us will benefit. And that's also why I created She Decides, a fund that um, wants to make sure that family planning services, uh, information on sexuality education, but also access uh, on uh, information of safe abortion and access to safe abortion is guaranteed for all women and girls in the world. And um, again, that's not something that will benefit an individual girl. It will benefit 
all of you it's sound and rational policy. And I do hope that today, at the end of the day, you will come up with many more sound and rational policies that will benefit the young people in Africa and that we might use also in our part of the world. Thanks a lot and good luck. <laughs>